Uh, I'm not muted anymore. Here we go. Okay, okay. here we go. So, one, two, three, go! I'm ready. Awesome. Welcome. Uh, thank you, guys. This has been amazing to listen to all day, I have to say. So, um, I know I'm almost the cleanup hitter, the last hitter before you, Javier. So, uh, thank you for including me. And uh, well, thank you for being with us. Uh, we know same. what you have to say. It's, a, it's an important part of what everybody has to hear. Um, well, been... um, I appreciate that because what we saw today was incredible um, ways to approximate the teeth, but not too much about what the actual approximation really meant to the neurophysiology and to the ultimate outcome. So uh, that's what this lecture is really all about. And it's a sort of a, I'm going to target, um, like Dara Chair, she said she was going to target what she spoke about in her interview. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to just show a few key points so that you uh, can follow what the disclusion time reduction concept is about and uh, then show you some of the clinical scenarios that it applies in and then a little research, a little bit with sleep, what it does for sleep and um, try to fit it in in this little bit of time that we have without taking up too much of your time, Javier, because you really deserve to talk. You've been this whole thing with you and, and um, Asri has been unbelievable. So um, I'll do Thank you. down to 30 minutes, okay? Phenomenal. All right, well, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna start, let's see if we can get to the T-scan. Here we go. Um, this is the T-scan EMG. So I'm going to show you the disclusion time reduction concept so you can understand what it really is and all of you can see it. And this is a very interesting case because I didn't get a perfect result, but it dramatically illustrates the physiology. Let me see if I can hide myself so I can see. No, there we go. Um, what you're looking at on the right is EMG. It's static at the moment, but it plays like a movie, as you can see. And what you're seeing on the left with my mouse is the T-scan. And what you're seeing down below is the force versus time graph of the T-scan, which is very important. It's, it's actually the most important software feature. It shows you exactly what happens in the movie. So I'm going to tell you what happens in the movie, and then I'll explain the rest of it. The black total force line is this black line. This is where the patient bites down in MIP. They hold their teeth together. They let go of MIP. They can't hold it, which is one of the really important things that T-scan shows you. It shows you that the patient can't keep their bite together because of muscle strain. Here they re-squeezed, and then here they went to the right. And I know they went to the right because this is a right excursion, but the blue quadrant, the line you see, that's the blue quadrant here in the T-scan data. So if I click over there, that's the blue quadrant. The red quadrant is the anterior guidance quadrant. You notice the anterior guidance quadrant doesn't work. It actually fails in this case beforehand. And the posterior right actually takes over. The orange quadrant is the posterior left. You can see that here. And this is an interesting concept for you to understand. I'm going to show it in those PowerPoint, but basically working side group function is the main player that causes all this muscle activity up here that you're seeing in this patient. Now look at his resting EMG. His resting EMG is pretty good. He has a little bit of spasm in the left masseter. Right. He's really not firing his muscles. Here's where he bites down. Here's where he holds his teeth together. Here's where he slides to the right. Disclusion time is measured from where the C line is, where the person begins their excursion, until they reach their anterior guidance. And in this case, the right quadrant, red quadrant failed. They didn't reach their anterior guidance. So the disclusion time here is infinite. And this is a class one patient. This is not an open bite patient. He has all his teeth, he has canine contact. He has, this is him at full contact. So I'll just show you the beauty of the T-scan. I'm just gonna play this up. The T-scan EMG, the time cursor is the same. And you see now the muscle activity filling in as the patient bites down. His bite is a little too left-sided. 10% off to the left. And from here, you see the muscle activity playing as a movie. So this is him trying to clench and hold his teeth together. And right here, he's going to fail. And when he fails, you're going to see the columns drop in the T-scan data. So he's letting go. So that's a marker for dysfunction. Then he re-squeezes, because I told him to re-squeeze. No bite down, Mr. Cristea. And now he's going to go to the right. I'm just going to stop this for a second. See this here? This is excursive friction. You cannot see this in any other way. This is the tops of the teeth rubbing together and creating friction. And you're going to watch it play in the movie. You're going to see this area stagger and chop instead of just dropping nicely. And while he's going to the right and this group function is about to form, look at all the muscle activity his bite is making. He's firing all his muscles exaggeratedly, 
way above risk. And this is the nature of what causes a lot of muscular TMD symptoms. So here's his movement to the right. And you see his center of force goes off to the right. He has a group function. Now notice the balancing side has very little contact, very little contact. The balancing side is not the player. Dental literature has said it is. The working side is the big player. Research shows the working side causes all this muscle activity. And you can see it here. The working side is fully engaged and the left side is disengaging. And yet there's all this muscle firing going on. And that's because the working side is a causative agent. The working side group function is the worst occlusal design. And now you're gonna see the friction. See the choppiness of the columns going up and going down instead of there being smooth disclusion. And then ultimately the anterior guidance is gonna fail, which is right now the red quadrant is gonna to start to lose contact and the posterior teeth are gonna be in contact. And that's gonna come right here. There you go. So that's what's wrong. And the disclusion time is measured from here to the end of the graph, the time is four seconds. So you're looking at class one patient who doesn't disclude in four seconds. And he's not trying to move fast or slow. He's just trying to move across his teeth. We don't give the patients a time. We just say, bite down and slide right. And they do it. And this is what you get when the back teeth rub together for longer than half a second, which is again, the neurology that people aren't really considering in putting the teeth together. Just because you put the teeth together doesn't mean they disclude. Now I treated him that same day. So you see, this is, this is an hour and a half later, and this is, I'm only showing you the right. We also do the left, we also do the protrusion. Look at this area. Now I'm gonna click into the one an hour later. Now look at how much muscle activity there is. Now it's not gone, it's not zero, but it's dramatically less, and I'm gonna click back. And now look forward, okay? That's the beginning of removing the excess muscle activity the teeth make. Now the reason I said I didn't get a perfect result because the T-scan is hard to beat. It makes you work better. As I said yesterday or two days ago, you see the real results. You can't just look in there and say, oh, the patient stood left. It looks like they disclude. No, that's not that way. It took me nine tenths of a second to free him. And you see there's still friction there. Some of that is muscle spasm. Some of that is teeth. And again, but the working side is a lot less. The blue is a lot less and the orange is still dropping out. So if we come to this point in the movie, now what you see, He's gonna move left, and the muscle activity levels are gonna stay much lower, much closer to the left side of the bar graph. So while he's using his teeth, and he reaches his anterior guidance much faster, and he ultimately discludes coming now, right? Almost one more frame. Right there, right? That took nine, almost a second. Before, it took four seconds. So this disclusion time is better, but, it's not ideal, and the T-scan tells you, it says, sorry, Dr. Kirstein, you didn't get it right. It's minus, it's a red stop sign, you gotta do better. Okay, so over the course of a few more appointments, I'll do better. A Couple of things to notice. notice. First, the center of force goes out to the canine lateral area. Notice here, the center of force goes into the premolar molar area. That's a big difference, okay? So this is a much better pathway for the forces to go. And you can see that here if I just drag this. See how it goes anteriorly. Okay, so that's the sh first day of shortening the exclusion time. Now he comes back a couple more times. Here he is a month later after healing. Now look at the EMGs. Almost no muscle activity. The exclusion time is 0.4. C-scan telling me it's okay. It's not a red stop sign. The T-scan is harsh. It will show you what you don't want to see. It'll show you the real truth instead of what you think you're seeing when you watch someone bite down and slide right or slide left or you think the teeth look nice and they all meet. A lot of people showed pictures today of the end result, but they didn't measure between the teeth at all. Okay, so that's what I'm getting at. The microocclusion is always at work, no matter how you position the mandible, no matter how you bring the teeth together. These kinds of things are always at work. So here's short disclusion now. The patient moves to the side. Now notice there's still group function. And this is the harsh reality. There is no immediate disclusion. There is no zero disclusion time. It always takes fractions of seconds to disclude because the condyle is not a hinge axis. It sits in the soft tissue disc and the back teeth stay together for time and distance every time the person moves sideways, no matter how steep the canine guidance is. I've studied it for a long time. We've been doing disclusion time reduction studies for years and having canine guidance doesn't guarantee you short disclusion and it doesn't guarantee you low muscle fire. Okay, so that's the principle. Here's the reality. Now he moves to the side, and in four tenths of a second, he reaches his anterior teeth, and his muscle activity is very low. Now look at the heel compared to day one. Right, that's the whole physiology right there. 
Okay, so now I'll teach you the anatomy of that. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll pick up my I'll pick up my PowerPoint if I can. There we go. Okay. Okay, so let me put this on slideshow if I can. There we go. Okay, so this is me working in Dr. Miguel Stanley's office, teaching people how to, teaching his team in Portugal how to use the T-scan and adjust prosthodontics, which is a great use of the T-scan. And if we have time at the end, I have a quick case of adjusting for time on prosthetic dentistry, because we talked about that as well. And I've written five volumes with the help of authors like Ben Sutter and Curtis Westerson and Mark Piper and Nick Yanios and Julia Cohen-Levy and many experts in, in oral surgery, implants, uh, Posture, Dr. Patrick Girard, um, uh, Asian, uh, Dr. Uh, Jin Wan Kim from Asia, incredible compilation of T-scan applications in every aspect of dental medicine. You want to learn where the T-scan applies to orthodontics? It's in here. You want to learn, learn where T-scan applies to, to uh, implant prosthodontics? Right here. So I am a consultant for TechScan, but I do not receive any compensation for sales of a TechScan product. And I've been using T-scan since 1984. I'm the oldest occlusal measurer in the United States. Okay, so how does exclusion time reduction work, what you just saw? Well, first you need the T-scan and you need the EMG because you can't measure fractions of seconds on the teeth with carbon paper or wax or silicone or any of the methods that people advocate for being accurate. And none of them are accurate. You wanna measure accuracy? Get the T-scan sensor out. It repeats the bite 24 times. It shows you 256 levels of force and it happens in fractions of seconds like you just saw. And the EMG component measures the muscles at the same exact time you record the T-scan data. So they're synchronized together. The disclusion time is a measure of the time the patient leaves MIP and travels to the side and moves at their own speed. We don't give them a speed, but they're very repetitive times. One study I did many years ago showed, you know, you did eight measurements in one direction. They were all within a tenth or two tenths of a second of each other. And um, so here you see middle of the excursion. And this is actually what you want to see when you're looking in somebody's mouth. You want them to move only a millimeter or so from, from their MIP and see if they disclude. And you'll see most people don't disclude because again, the condyle sits in a soft tissue disc and the back teeth are in a soft environment. The, the condyle's in a soft environment. So the movement to the side, the back teeth stay together. And you can't see the lingual from this view at all. Okay? Greater than half a second is known as long disclusion time. Now this is what it looks like on paper. And you've all seen this. That's long disclusion time. That's long disclusion time. That's long disclusion time. That's long disclusion time. All of this is long disclusion time, like there and like there. And of course this is, that's premolar guidance, but that's long disclusion right there. How long does it take to go from there to there? Nobody knows until you put a T-scan sensor in there. And so the beauty of the T-scan is it measures all of these things at the same time, and then it's synchronized with the muscle firing. So it's incredibly detailed um, diagnosis that you make. In, in um, 1991, I published the first exclusion time reduction paper, which basically showed class one patients who their mean pretreatment was 1.4 seconds. Now, class one is supposed to have immediate exclusion. No, it doesn't have immediate exclusion, despite what you may think, all of you, and you may think you're seeing visually. This was hundreds of patients, that, not this study, but we've done one with hundreds of patients where the mean class one patients were 1.4 seconds. That's not immediate. Immediate is close to zero. So when we treated this patient, their red excursion, here they're moving to the right, and you see that their masses are firing at 33 and 22. That's the average from here to here. But after we treated this person, not only could they clench less firmly, which is a real great advantage of taking pressure off the entire dentition, but their disclusion time, whoops, let me go back. Their muscle activity levels in the same excursion dropped 10 times, 10 times less muscle activity. And you saw it with my clinical example. We also discovered with the T-scan MG, that's, that's what this paper is, that group function is the major player. And unless you understand that, you want to allow your patient to have group function, you're always going to have high muscle fire. So if you put a crown up here that has group function, you're going to have high muscle fire. So working side group function is the most problematic occlusal design because it makes the most muscle activity, much more than balancing contact. And that may surprise many of you because you've been hearing from, from many occlusal camps that Balancing side contacts are bad. Well, it's not that they're good. But they don't cause the problems that working side group function does. Working side group function turns on all these muscles, crushes the teeth under all this muscle load, sands them away, flexes them, which causes their pulps to fire this neuroanatomy. And um, so it's a big problem working side group function. Much worse 
and balance the side contact. So this is what working side group function looks like. This is another patient. They're biting down. They're holding their teeth together. They slide to the right. Again, you see the friction in the black line. You see the blue quadrant is in charge. And then the red quadrant slowly takes charge. And then you get this. You get all this muscle firing. Now you take that same patient and give them, look very carefully here at C, the red takes over right away. The blue is still active. Remember I said there's no zero disclusion time. There's blue in there and there's orange in there, but they dissipate in three tenths of a second. And this is what's going on. That's how you heal someone from within the central nervous system. You don't need an appliance to do that. You need the teeth to operate differently. And you can't do it with solely like tooth movement or prosthetic dentistry that has anterior guidance built in. It doesn't work that way. All those scenarios could be refined to have short disclusion time and they will end up with a much more stable occlusion with a lot less muscle tension and many redu reductions in visits like coming back to get your bite adjusted after crowns are put in. So this is the effect. And most of the symptoms of, let's say, most of the muscle activity resolves within 30 to 90 days and many of the symptoms resolve in 30 to 90 days. And we have multiple studies. I, I can't even tell you how many studies there are on this that show this effect and prove that it removes symptoms. So it's up to dentistry to come to realize measuring the occlusion and treating it microscopically at fractions of seconds is really the high level control over the occlusion. Okay, so let me skip this. So how does it work? So you understand the anatomy. First of all, as teeth rub across each other excursively, even for short periods of time, as I showed you, the pulps are flexed and the periodontal ligaments are compressed. And that incites neural reflexes. So you get this kind of thing. Here's a class one patient. They have group function. They have bite down. They hold their teeth together. They slide to the right. Watch what happens. The center of force goes right into the molar area. The blue quadrant is in control, just like I showed you. The balancing side drops out, and you see the muscle activity firing away. But notice the temporalis tapers to the D line. The D line is the moment of disclusion, which you're going to see in a moment. The muscle activity is lowest at the D line. Look at the taper. Okay. Now we treat that person. We take that 1.4 seconds and we make it 0.3 seconds. And so you can't tell that here and there's still a premolar involved and we can't see the lingual. Again, visual assessments do not tell you what's really going on, although this one is telling me that I didn't disclude the premolar. Oh, let me show you, show you the movie. So here's the movie. Now look at the differences. I'll play it again. The patient starts moving. The red quadrant takes over right away. The blue and the orange quickly drop out. The guidance takes over much faster. And then you see the muscle activity quickly drop down to low levels and shut off. And that you can only do because of the neurophysiology. So let's go through what that is. First of all, very small areas of tooth contact make this happen. Very small areas. These one and two millimeter zones where the, lower, the upper palatal cusp is rubbing back and forth in there, or the upper buccal incline of the um, upper buccal cusp is rubbing against this the palatal slope and the distal buccal slope. Same thing here. This is all long disclusion. Look how long it takes to go from there, right? How long does it take to make that line? That's what long disclusion looks like. Okay. Now, how does it work? This is a patient who lost all his root structure from long disclusion. He wasn't a TMJ patient. He had group function his whole life. He's a 65 year old, very famous doctor, and he was tired of having his roots bonded and his gums receding and his doctor telling him he's brushing his teeth too hard, although he didn't brush too well there. <laughs> And yet his problem is not toothbrushing. It's friction in his bite and high muscle firing, flexing the teeth, causing the roots to crack. Long disclusion has a lot of applications in many different facets of dentistry. So here's the neuroanatomy. The posterior tooth pulps and the PDL mechanoreceptors have the most unique peripheral neuroanatomy in the entire human body. And I talked about this the other day. Their afferents are the only peripheral nerves to synapse inside the central nervous system. The only one in your entire body. All the other peripheral nerves stop outside the spinal column. They don't go in right away. And they certainly don't enter the brain right away. But these do. The pulp uh, from the posterior teeth, and the, that's the premolars and the molars, and the PDL. And their first synapse is to two motor centers. The muscles of mastication get triggered to fire, and the muscles of swallowing. And that's why disclusion time reduction has airway effects, which I'm going to show you at the end. So here's how it works neuroanatomically. This is a neuro diagram, and the green pathway is the one that we're concerned with. These are fifth and seventh cranial afferents, but notice the red and the blue. They all have peripheral synapses. Not the green one. The green one travels all the way in. So let's look at that up close. 
this is from the molar pulps and the uh, premolar pulps and PDLs. We have this pathway that goes into the mesencephalic nucleus and passes through the mesencephalic nucleus. It doesn't synapse there. It travels on to the trigeminal motor nucleus bilaterally, but also to the center of the brain, the reticular formation. This is a huge area in the brain. This is why posture improves when you change someone's bite or breathing improves or sleep improves, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So this pathway is the efferent pathway and the trigeminal motor nucleus pathway is here and it synapses with all these structures. Well, those structures are the muscle mastication, the tensor tympani, which controls the um, eardrum, the tensor veli palatini, which is a swallowing muscle, and the pa soft palate contractor, the myelohyde and the digastrics. And then there's something I'll show you in a little bit later on about the fifth cranial nerve and how special that is. But this group of muscles is all contracted every time you rub your teeth together. You cannot control it. It's not something you have any control over. It's modulating, swallowing. Someone earlier today, one of the lectures said, we swallow 2,000 times a day. Your teeth are touching 2,000 times a day. You cannot turn this mechanism off, but you can turn it down by dealing with the disclusion time. So what TMD muscular symptoms are is really when the swallow mechanism backfires on the patient. It hyperfunctions all their muscles from their teeth rubbing together incorrectly. That's why you see so many class twos who have TMJ. That's why you see people who have lack of anterior contact have TMJ, or let's say muscular symptoms. Let's put, call it muscular symptoms. So this is the mechanism. And then what happens to people is as they get, they rub their teeth together when they become young people, they start getting their dentition, they create this cycle of firing up their muscles that you can't stop because every time the teeth rub together, you get this muscle contraction. So lactic acid builds up, toxic neural input goes into the brain through the reticular formation, toxic um, neural output comes to the muscles of mastication, causes them to fire, like you saw in my first screen with all that muscle activity. That's coming directly from the back teeth, directly from the back teeth. And so it goes on and on and on. And then the symptoms appear and the person starts to have trouble chewing, they start to get headaches, they can't, they can't stop grinding their teeth, they wake up with a stiff jaw. And all of that is tied to the disclusion time. Now here's one of the most fascinating things about the neurology that you all should take home with you. The fifth cranial nerve is used by three other cranial nerves for those fibers to reach their destinations on the head. Cranial nerve three, which is the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve seven, which is the facial nerve, and cranial nerve nine, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve. So the conduit that the, that the um, trigeminal nerve is also puts noxious output from the teeth into these three cranial nerves, which is why you have facial symptoms sometimes where you don't have the jaw, but you have the mid face. And sometimes you have eye twitching and, and side, of the, side of the eye is like sore and, and, and you can't control your eye, it flutters. And then this is tongue pressure and neck pressure and glossopharyngeal nerve obviously is a major player in swallowing. So the teeth are talking to four cranial nerves directly, influencing four cranial nerves directly and the center of the brain. So when someone says TMJ has nothing to do with the occlusion, they're completely wrong, completely wrong. And I will categorically state that. We've been seeing it for years, just treating the disclusion time. Now, somebody asked the other day, is the restored person in a, in a myocentric position? Doesn't that account for the neurology? No, no position accounts for the neurology. You crown teeth and put them together in CR or an NM bite, a myobite, it, all the neurology comes back together. All you have to do is have incorrect contact, just like here. This has, case has canine guidance, but they're not discluded here, and they're not discluded here. And so, and you can't see the lingual, right? So canine guidance doesn't guarantee you disclusion, and that's because the condyle sits in the soft tissue of the disc. So the position has nothing to do with the neurology. You cannot counter the neurology position, and you cannot counter it when you're restoring people. Look at this case. This girl is about to have an implant restored. She had very nice smile design done a few years back. Since then, she had a lot of symptoms. She has a fairly steep exit angle, but when she moves to the right, you see she's moved a small distance. Remember I said you only want the person to move a small distance? All the crowns are together. And then she makes all this muscle activity, all of it. It can't be turned off. Look at the friction in the graph, right? What quadrant is active? The blue is fighting it out with the red, and then ultimately the blue wins, and the red loses. And this is the T-scan with the STL file, for those of you who haven't seen it. This is um, uh, the T-scan 10. You can incorporate the STL file right into the desktop. And here's the long disclusion. 
right? That's supposed to be a guidance angle that's going to free the patient, but it doesn't free the patient. Even on the lingual, it doesn't free the patient. That's here as, here as well. So the reality is, this is like the micro occlusion, and this created a lot of symptoms for this girl. So then we treated her, and you see the center of force takes a more anterior guided pathway, and this is the same day. This is at 2.43 p.m., and this is at 1.48 p.m. So look at all this muscle activity. Now, and we treated her, and this is only the right excursion, and look how it's beginning to dissipate, right? That's without an appliance. That's without moving the mandible. That's just treating the occlusion with very high precision outcomes. And there you see again, the red takes control, but the blue and the orange are in there. There's no zero disclusion time. And those people that are advocating immediate posterior disclusion, you don't have it. Trust me. You put the T-scanning sensor in there, you won't see it. I've been looking at it for years. So we've been studying this since 1991. We have over 50 papers, many of them hard science numbers and tables and data and sets. And it shows that if you have healthy joints, and I'm not talking about perfect joints, I'm talking about less than Piper 4A, so displacement with reduction, clicking and popping, no locking and dislocating, and you have normal skeletal relations and normal, um, generally normal occlusal relations, you can treat clenching and grinding of the teeth, you can remove facial pain, you can stop tired chewing, you can remove temporal headaches, you can remove jaw tension. That's one of the most fast, fastest things to go away. The patients leave the office and then he can attest to this. They'll say to you, God, my face, it feels a lot looser ever since you did that to my bite, right then and there in the chair. If they have clicking and popping, as long as they're not locking and dislocating, you can treat them as, again, with the correct diagnosis, CBCT of the joints, uh, range of motion of the joints, if you need an MRI of the joints. But I'm talking to you about patients that you always see that come in, in your office. They're young women, middle-aged women with headaches and facial pain. They grind their teeth. Their kids drive them crazy. Their husband drives them crazy. They don't need jaw repositioning in 28 units. They need to get rid of their symptoms. They have to be able to open reasonably well. And again, normal occlusal relations. And this is a real marker for the need to shorten the disclusion time. They wear an appliance, but they still have symptoms. And this paper was published in 1995. It was a 10-year recall study. We have papers now with uh, much more detail, much many more metrics. And maybe if I have time, I'll get to show them to you. So once you clear someone's joints as being free to, you know, free to treat, then it's a matter of what is their anterior guidance capability. And um, so this patient, you see the canines are out of place. Here we would use the centrals and laterals to disclude the person because the neurology is the same as the canine. Here, here you can use the canines, no question. Okay. Now this is Dr. Sutter. He had his disclusion time change. Look where his midline is. This is very treatable. He has, we can use the inner surface of the lower incisors against the outer surface of these buccal um, incisors, canine and lateral, and we did do this in order to disclude him. And here we used the lateral against the canine, not the canine against the premolar. And this is the kind of subtlety that you're dealing with when you're looking at it neurologically. But here you see he moved to the right and he's not discluded, right? Look at that hanging molar, right? Here he's moving to the left. He has overlap, he has anterior teeth to touch, but he's not discluded. Again, have them move a short distance from the and look where he was, right? He moved this far, right? That's as far as he moved. And then you can see the lack of disclusion. And this is a very important clinical skill we teach dentists. Whoops, so these are just a couple more examples of, this is a very treatable patient. This side will be easy to treat because the canine is steeper, but this is bad. These angles of posterior teeth when they lean toward each other create a lot of friction. friction. And this is worse. Whoops, sorry, my muscles are a little active. I'm trying to move fast. Canine flaring. That makes it very hard to disclude someone. And so this case would require more precise corrections than this case would. And here's a patient that needs ortho. And I see a lot of these patients that come in, they had ortho when they were kids and somebody actually showed an example earlier of how they grew, I think it was Dara, showed they left the child with intercuspated occlusion and then he was a young adult and then he had an open bite, right? Because his jaw grew, his, his condyle grew, whatever grew. This patient went through ortho for the second time to couple them, and then they could go through disclusion time reduction. This patient finished Invisalign, and some people would say, oh, that's too deep a bite. You better open the bite. This is a dentist. She had pain on her posterior teeth for years that went away in the same visit once she was discluded. This is a dentist who um, has been trained on DTR. So um, this is a patient that would need ortho, and this is a patient that needs ortho and perio. See, the lack of the guides that he's had his whole life See the open canine contact? 
lack of overlap, that's flexed all these roots, caused all this damage because every time he moves sideways, he's pushing his teeth back and forth like this. So you have to have overlap. And that was something that a few of the orthodontists discussed. It's very important to have overlap when you finish your cases, whether it be prosthodontically or, ended, or, um, or uh, orthodontically. So now, let me show you some very interesting things. DTR, again, it works from within the central nervous system. It does relax a lot of those structures that we talked about. So Ben participated in, in my second edition, uh, the most recent update of the clinical applications of computerized occlusal analysis. And he talks about a number of cases that he did. Well, this wasn't supposed to have, it was supposed to be like this. This is the airway before treatment. It's hard for you to read. It says um, 2101 millimeters squared and 41 millimeters squared. After DTR, one month, 20,786 millimeters squared, 207 millimeters squared. Look at the difference, right? No appliance, no mandibular advancement, no sleep appliance, just de-stressing the pharynx area, which is again, because of the central nervous system and the tie-in that the teeth have to the palatal pharyngeal, uh, glossopharyngeal nerve and to the tensor veli palatini. Okay, so the airway automatically opens. Now, here's another example. This is a lateral view. This is pre-DTR. Look at the constriction through here. And the middle of the airway is 4.86 millimeters. This is without the numbers. After DTR treatment, 8 millimeters where there was 4, 7 millimeters where there was 5, and the lower airway didn't change. Well, that would make sense. Neurologically, there's no nerves that go down there from the teeth, only the pharynx. That's where the big change would be. Look at the difference between the airways. Look at the constriction. Now look at the opening, although there is an interesting shape there. I'm not sure what that is anatomically. And that's from DTR, relaxing the physiology. Again, no appliance, no pretreatment, no, no uh, repositioning, no uh, uh, deprogramming. The deprogramming comes from within the central nervous system. That's why we can bypass all that stuff. Now, last thing I'll show you, uh, well, if I can, if I have some time, I'll show the adjusting for time and closure. Just to show you what we've been able to show, excluding time reduction improves human chewing. There is no study in the literature that shows if you make a splint or you advance the mandible or you tense the person or you do all the treatments that everybody tries to do, that you can improve human chewing. DTR has been shown to be able to improve human chewing in two studies now. It also treats cold sensitivity without medicaments and without, without uh, bonding the roots. It also lessens TM disc pathology because it relaxes the lateral pterygoid. With this, you can drop the Piper level two levels. That's what the studies show. If you're a Piper three, when you're done with DTR, you'll probably be a Piper one. And this is one of the most important ones that we've been able to treat emotional depression using depression scales, not, oh, how do you feel today, Mrs. Smith, but real depression scales known as the Beck, the Beck Depression Inventory. Patients would fill it out at every visit. And we've been able to resolve depression and chronic pain patients without any other therapy but treating their teeth. No psychological therapy, no antidepressants, no medications, nothing. And Ben is part of these studies, so he can tell you all about it. So let me show you the chewing study, and then I'll show you how to adjust the time and closure, and then I'll wrap it up. So the chewing study is fascinating. A lot of you are talking about mastication. A lot of you are talk talking about, you know, mandibular motion. If you want to study this, you need a jaw tracker. And you've got to really measure it. You know, watching people and taking videos with your, with your camera or your phone isn't adequate, not in today's world. So here's a chewing trace of a DTR patient, 20 cycles chewing gum on one side of their mouth, left side of their mouth. And you see how variable their chewing strokes are. Some are shorter, some are longer, some are more sweeping, some are broader. They're not uniform. They get a little more uniform the more chewing the person does. And um, in the jaw track, you have three dimensions of chewing. You have the horizontal plane, you have the frontal plane, and you have the sagittal plane. And what happens is the, the software then puts together a chewing stroke after the person chews gum and calls it the average chewing pattern. And here you see the, this exclusion time reduction patient before they were treated. And they have uh, 16, 17 millimeters of vertical. They open their chewing to the left, so they open to the left, they close to the right. These black ellipses are norms based on healthy patients who don't have any chewing dysfunction. So you see, and this would be the normal chewing, whoops, sorry, this would be normal chewing to the left is actually, she's, this person's not doing that. She's chewing more to the right, okay? And then sadly, you're supposed to chew under your chin. See where you are going under your chin. This lady's chewing out in front of her nose. And the worst one was the heart, oh, sorry. The worst one was the horizontal. The horizontal, you're supposed to be chewing out from your face and back in. She's chewing behind her head. 
right? I'm not sure how she's doing that, but you see the pathways behind her. So um, it's really a muscular problem. Then the person goes through DTR. This is T-scan 8, which has different colors, but you see the same features. The patient bites down, holds their teeth together, tries to move to the side. The pink and light blue quadrants are the posterior teeth. That's all that's active. The anterior teeth, the dark blue, it's not active. The person can't exclude. Look at all the muscle activity they're making. Again, they wait to bite, they bite down, they hold, they slide. In this case, to the left. Massive amounts of muscle activity. We treat that. This is the patient's treatment. Again, the harsh reality of measuring. There's still muscle activity there. It's not a perfect flat line. And this is what I meant about how the technologies will improve you. You know, they, th this technology will improve you. These will. They'll show you, well, you didn't do as well as you could. And sure enough, if you look carefully at this graph, there's suddenly the blue, light blue is dropping and the pink is dropping, but suddenly there's a spike in light blue, which means I missed something, right? And then the dark blue takes over. There's the dark blue. But this is still a massive improvement for this person. Then they choose seven days later. So here's the pre-op. This is the seven day later. Look at the width the person got in their chewing stroke. Look at the increase in vertical, 19 millimeters, right? Now, what about the norms? Now the person's chewing not inside the norm, but much more inside the norm. And sagittally, the person's chewing under their nose. Horizontally, they're going out and back instead of behind their head. No chewing instructions, no appliances, no therapies, no anything, no Botox, nothing. Just fixing the disclusion, automatically fix their chewing stroke. Now the thing about the study is we had 30 or 40 patients. These are all the statistics. Look at the p-values. Now some of you may not know what p-values are, but when you read a paper and it says p less than 0.05, it means that 95% of the time that change was statistically significant. When you have numbers, P numbers, where they're three and four zeros, this is P less than 99.99.5% of the time this change occurred, that the pe people got faster, they were able to open faster, they were able to close faster, they were able to stay in contact with their teeth for shorter periods of time, they were able to cycle through their chewing much faster, and then a variety of other things we measured. Again, look at the P values. Look at this one. This is like, the, this is the speed of opening. The whole group increased dramatically in order to get a p-value like that, right? So this is the kind of statistics we work with. We're not just saying, oh, this works, you should, you should use it. No, we've been studying this for a long time. Here's one of the other very important effects. The, this patient you've been following with me through the study, before the DTR treatment, she had 16, uh, in 16 cycles of chewing, she had 12 silent periods. Silent periods are where your muscles shut off from noxious stimuli. They stop contracting. She had 12 in 16 cycles. After DTR, one week later, she had one silent period. So the teeth weren't in the way, and I know that sounds very simplistic, but that's the essence of it. But in a time frame, it's not that they're out of the way or in the way, it's how fast are they out of the way. Now, this is really fascinating. This was one person, that same person, this was all his 20 chews to the right, every muscle contraction cycle. So you look at the, this is the right temporalis. There were some that were early, there were some that were in the middle of the chewing stroke, there was someone in the end of the chewing stroke. And you see that same thing in all four of these muscles. Seven days later, look at how harmonious they are. They're all on top of each other. Again, no therapies, no out, outside treatments, no splints, no chewing instructions. These things are all measured from within the hard confines of software and hardware that are measuring, measuring physiology. So this is what the T-scan EMG really offers you. Okay, so now, last thing, because I'm trying to be very fast. I mentioned in the interview with Javier that was really fascinating to participate in that day as well, that you can adjust for time. So I just showed you adjusting for time in excursions is to shorten the disclusion time down to very high tolerances, less than half a second. That does a lot of things for the patient's physiology, as you saw. Sleep effects, muscle activity effects, symptoms go away, depression goes away. There's a lot of things that go away, and it's all documented. But in prosthetic dentistry, you also want to adjust, adjust for time and closure. So this case is a really good example of that. These are two provisions that the patient can't wear, and they've been sent to me from Pennsylvania to check them on the T-scan because this patient can't wear the provisionals, and they've been trying and trying and trying to adjust them. So here's the how you use the T-scan data. What happens is when you get back a recording, you map the uneven forces to the carbon paper marks. That's all you use the carbon paper marks for. You don't guess at them. You don't try to figure out which ones are the forceful ones because you'll be wrong. 
Let's look at the distribution here. Where would you adjust if you didn't have the T-scan? Would you adjust that mark right there? Unlikely. You might adjust over here, but lo and behold, but there is low force. How could that be? The ink marks are big because the ink survives when the forces are low. When the forces are high, the carbon paper gets chopped up into small bits. Okay, so you have to realize the carbon paper isn't showing you anything, time or force. Now this is a static image. So let's look at what happens. What we're gonna do is play the, the video of this bite. Okay, so there's the early contacts. All right, I just stopped it. This is what you do with the T-scan. You play the movie up and you look for, oh, these are all too early. I'm gonna adjust those. You don't look for the most forceful one. You look for all the ones that are rising too fast. So I'm gonna adjust these areas and then I'm gonna play the movie a little further. And then I'm going to adjust over here and over here and I'm going to adjust over here again and then I'm going to adjust over here and then I'm going to reach full contact and that's pretty much all that needs to be adjusted here 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 and here and maybe earlier on in here then I make a new movie now one thing I want to show you about this see it says it's balanced this is what Javier was talking about the snake ending up in the middle the t-scan shows you the case is balanced but the contacts are horrible right so this means nothing until this is all low force. This being in the middle just means there's six implants under overload. That's another great feature of the T-scan. It warns you if your implants are under overload. I don't think carbon paper does that. A silicone or wax does that. Or a deprogrammer certainly doesn't do that. Okay, so this is movie one. Now I'm gonna show you the one right after. Okay, now there are only two implants that are, that are under overload. The other implants, you know, there's no longer high forces on them. So let's see what this one looks like. Ah, oh, there's way too early a contact here, right? You'd never be able to detect this. The patient's coming in, they're closing into intercuspation. We stop right there. There's my first two adjustments. Whatever, I have the patient bite down, I mark these two teeth only, I don't care about the rest of it, and I go right to that. Then I go further into the movie. And you see this is the next area, and this is the next area, and this is the next area. So I know exactly where to go. That midline, the incisal third of six, the mesial of four. Right? I know exactly where to go. All I have to do is mark the teeth and map the T-scan arch to the case. That's another mistake that people make is they, they don't adjust the arch to match the case. Okay, so that's the end of this movie. Now again, there's pretty good balance, but look what there are. Two implants overloaded, a very significant time prematurity that you would never be able to detect with your eye. Never. Okay? All of that happened in like two tenths of a second. Okay? That's how fast all this is going on. Now, this is the one at the end of the day. So I'm not gonna show you the whole sequence. This probably is five or six movies later. Watch what happens. Everything rises together and it's all low force. And the center of force is right in the middle, perfectly balanced. And that's adjusting for time. You take out the fast rising forces, you target them specifically wherever they are and that automatically balances the bite. So this is where we started here at 11.12 in the morning. We finished 40 minutes later. Look at the difference. This is how I send all my cases home. You can only do this with a T-scan. You can't do this with carbon paper. You can't do this with tents. You can't, you can't. You need a T-scan to be able to do this. And now no implants are under overload. And this principle can be applied to any full arch uh, prosthesis any full arch prosthesis. It changes a little when you have implants and teeth together, which, which uh, we don't really have time to talk about what we did in the meeting where we use a time delay. But this is the nature of how you can control forces at delivery on any case that's full arch, anything that's full arch. So thank you very much for your time. Um, if you have questions, this is my email down here, tmjdoc. And um, if you're at all interested in uh, DTR and learning about it, Ben and I give courses about it um, a few times a year. I also teach people directly in their office how to do it um, with patients, which is, as I said the other day, the best way to learn because you actually learn how to read the T-scan, record with the T-scan, read it, and um, then adjust with it. And until you have that experience with knowledge, it's a complicated learning process. It's, uh, uh, as I said the other day, company learning is great, but nothing replaces chair-side learning with the T-scan. And the beauty of my um, education is I come to you. You don't leave your office to go like fly for a week and take courses and not see any patients. You, you see patients the day before and the day after. And the day after, you're equipped to really help them. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. So now I'll stop my share. Okay, so.
Fantastic. Yeah. Opened up a whole another vortex that's my god, this is so crazy. Who the hell want to hear have you?